Hey, welcome back. Good to see you again. Thanks for joining the channel. Hope you're all well. All right, so this is the second part of the three-part series that I'm making on these 330s. Now, this is the Harman Kardon 330B. Last week, we looked at the 330A. We made a few improvements to uh, how it uh, works and performs. Did some work on it. Now, I'm going to say I took that receiver and listened to it for probably two weeks and it sounded fantastic. It sounded great. I had no issues with it. Well, it did have one little issue I'm not happy about is uh, the bass response seems a little thin. Now, it's, well, no, it actually wasn't thin. It was there, but it just wasn't defined. It wasn't precise. Now, the bass kind of got boomy a lot below 40 hertz or so. It started to get boomy and uh, but everything else with that receiver sounded great. And it didn't sound too bad with the bass. Um, you just didn't want to turn the bass up because it just didn't sound good. I think that's probably a function of the capacitor outputs and using a thousand microfarad cap. I probably could upsize that cap to 1500 or 2200 and had a better response in the base, but I didn't do want to do that on that receiver at that time. I think I think the receiver is just perfect the way it is. Uh, it sounds good, and I hope my client uh, agrees with me. He's going to listen to it too. He's going to pick it up here in a few days. So it's going back to him and he can listen to it. So this is a 30, 330B. This one belongs to me. This one was featured in episode 81, and I'll, if I remember, I'll put a link up in the top. Did a lot of work to this one back on that video. I can just summarize it here for you. I removed the phono stage from the from this unit and I replaced it with uh, one of my um, boards I got made at PCB Way. And uh, I tried out the, the phono stage on this. It sounds pretty good. I, I do need a new stylus for my cartridge. It's sounding pretty shrill right now and distorted. Uh, I think once I get that sorted, this will sound a lot better. I replaced the power amplifier board in this and I replaced a lot of the components in the power amplifier. So it's basically got a brand new power amplifier in it. I fixed a lot of the butchered, well, it was butchered. I, I fixed the butchered mains wiring, that um, power coming in. Somebody hacked out the uh, the outlet and removed it. So I put that all back and uh, put that back to normal. Uh, added LED retrofit for the function lamps. And actually this, uh, receiver sounds pretty good before i start wanted to do this series i pulled this one out of uh hiatus it's been sitting in in, in hiatus for three years now pulled it out plugged it in and uh, i was greeted with a few more problems that i need to fix these switches are uh terrible they're losing contact the function switch is the worst the speaker switch is dirty too because i have to really fight with this switch to get it to make a connection same with the source monitor there's all these switches need to be reworked and this function switch here needs to be reworked the potentiometers are good uh, everything else is good another uh, improvement i made to this is i upgraded the power supply filter cap from 2200 microfarads to 8200 microfarads probably four times the size and that gave us a measured increase of uh, or somewhere around 10% in power output. So that was a good, uh, a good modification, I think. And uh, that was well worth doing. Um, so my plans for this today are, we are going to open it up and have a look inside. I know there's still caps that I haven't changed in the tone amplifier and in the tuners. Now, listening to this last couple days, I think the bass is kind of thin. It sounds thin and, and just weak. Um, and when you turn up the bass knob, it just kind of goes bleh, and it just makes more awful noise. Uh, so we're going to address that. I think caps in the tone amplifier are done, and I think they need to go. So we're going to replace caps. I have the remainder of the caps here. There's a small amount, and we're going to do that. Another thing we're going to do is we're going to have a look at the internal wiring of this thing to see if Harman Kardon made any improvements to it from the last model because the last model, the 330A, it was just terrible. It was all wired with 22 gauge and uh, it just wasn't working very good. So we're going to look at the wiring. We're going to look at uh, finishing the recap 
and then we're going to do some before and after testing too as well because I have a feeling these caps I, I want to make some measurements before and after I change caps to see if we can notice any difference in the signal like that's going through it all right looking inside so some of the biggest changes they made on this uh, 330b from the 330a has to do with uh, the power amplifier on the 330a the amplifier was all on one board and they made the connections between the tone amplifier section and the tone controls were all made underneath this here is a little different they split the tone amplifier or they call it a control amplifier and uh, the power amplifier in two and they mounted them on separate boards so these are all old caps these are all brand new caps another big change they made between the 330A and the 330B is the FMIF section here. Um, I don't know if you remember, but they had uh, tuning transformers cans. There's four of them here, and now they reduced it down to one. And they've uh, their IF strip has changed quite a bit. They have mechanical filters, transistor amplifier, but there's no tuning for uh, transformers. That took that all out and they just made one strip. This is a discriminator coil, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming. And uh, made huge changes there. Another thing they made huge changes at is the multiplex board. Um, the multiplex before relied on uh, some transformers and some transistors. Here they removed all that and they just did it with a single chip. It's a BA1310. And uh, I gotta say, listening to this last few days, this is working really well. And the multiplex, good, good stereo, stereo separation, uh, very weak stations, it picks up stereo signal. So the FM tuner in this is working great. I just wanna upgrade all these caps and get rid of the old ones and put some brand new ones in. And again, I mentioned the filter, main filter cap I replaced. This used to be 2200 and we upsized it to 8200 and that, provided about a 10% increase in output power from the from the previous. So everything else is pretty much the same. I think the AM tuner section, the AMIF is remained the same. I didn't look too closely at the circuits, but it hasn't looked like it changed. And the phono stage itself has remained the same as well. And uh, I think that's about it. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna start by replacing caps on these four boards and get all new caps in the complete receiver. But first we're gonna do some measurements. All right, one thing I wanna do right off the bat here is take some measurements of our internal resistance of the speaker wiring inside here. We have the same layout as before, uh, more or less, what do I have here? We have purple and green, that's our right and left, or left and right, whatever. It goes under and around here, all the way under here, and comes out and connects to the switches. Now this is all run beside the mains wiring as well, as I noticed on the 330A. All this speaker wiring here that's going alongside of the mains wiring will pick up noise that's induced from the line cord that comes in and uh, will uh, show up as clicks and pops in your, in your audio when you get appliances that switch on and off. So let's check here, start here on this green wire, and then our other one, I think is our right channel. I'm not sure. Okay, so here, this is system two. System two, okay. So again, we're seeing the same thing. Let me show you. Okay, so here's the right channel on system two speakers, you're getting about 120 milliohms. Open, closed, 135. Open, closed, 110. So it's not consistent and it's well over 100 milliohms. Let's try the, um, let's try the other system. Turn this one on. We're getting, uh, oh, we're almost getting one ohm here. 350, two, yeah, so these switches are very dirty. And we're getting, uh, okay, if I keep working the switch, about 180 milliohms, all right. Let's try the other channel. This is the left channel now. 
on system one. 200 milliohms, 600, 300. Yeah, this is no good. Okay, let's try system two. Getting two, three ohms, 350, 500. Yeah, so one thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna rewire the speaker switches with these, I think this is 22 gauge again. Let me uh, see if I can pick something off one of these wires. Might not be marked. It doesn't say. Pretty sure it's 22 gauge. Let me strip it a little bit and measure it. Stranded, stranded now, so. Kawasaki. Yeah, there's no, there's no indication of what wire size that is. I have a feeling it's 22 gauge. So again, I'm gonna go through and rewire this. Also, I'm gonna make the same modifications I did with the other model, the 330A. I'm gonna move the star ground off the capacitor onto the steel chassis. And then I can tie all my grounds there instead of having them all converge on this capacitor. And uh, I think that's a little bit of an improvement. And then these power wires need to be upgraded as well. All these power wires are thin gauge wire. Especially this one here, the pink with white stripe. It goes all the way back here to the fuses. And uh, let's measure that one right now while we're here. And we're getting 30 milliohms. Yeah, that should be lower than that. It should be down around five or six. So I'm going to do some, uh, and do some rewiring of this, just like I did on the 330A. I'm going to um, rip out all the speaker wiring and the power grounds, and we're going to replace those with heavy gauge wire. Okay, I got a lot of things going on here at once. I got everything wired in for doing a power test. I got my eight ohm load. I got a scope connected to the outputs, measuring the voltage. RMS voltage of the outputs. So I want to do some baseline tests here to see what is going on. And uh, just starting off, um, I want to do some before and after. Like I didn't do this with the 330A. I should have done it in some before and after tests to uh, just to see where we're at. But we're going to do it now. And uh, one thing I want to determine is how much is our maximum power output of the amp fire after uh, I did these modifications before and then I'm going to check it again after I do these modifications I plan so here's what we got going right now this is our main power rail voltage and you see we got 55.3 volts on the main filter cap now if I start ramping up the volume I can uh, put this into clipping. Okay, right about there. I know, I'm sorry, I don't have two cameras to do the picture in picture. I'm just going to back it off until the clipping stops. It's right about there. I'm getting 13.61, sorry, 13.62 volts RMS on the output. And let's check our power. Now we're down to 46.8, which is, uh, I think it's about 9 volt drop, or 9 volt sag. It's doing better than the 330A, right off the bat. Now, I just want to see what we have for a drop between the power amplifier and the speaker outlet. So right here... Getting about 100, 200 millivolts drop, and that's through all the resistance in the circuits. This one's down at 183 volts, uh, millivolts. 
which isn't that bad, I don't think. We're going to see if we can get that those millivolts back up. Now, one thing I'm going to do is we have it on uh, scope. I'm going to test the square wave response of this amplifier. So let's turn this down and let's set it up for square waves. All right, there's a thousand hertz tone, and the uh, tone controls are set pretty flat. Here's base cut. Here's base boost. And you can see they don't, both channels don't track perfectly well together. Here's treble cut. And treble boost. Oh, got one channel a little flaky there. Why is it twitching out? Okay, we got a problem in the right. Okay, so this is a thousand hertz. What I want to do is I want to go down in frequency. And I want to see how it behaves. Let's see here. 9, 10. I see one channel's getting really far out from the other. That right channel. Space boost base cut somewhere flat here let's go down we're at uh, 300 Hertz right now let's go down I think as we go down it's just gonna get worse and worse we're at 100 Hertz you see the difference between the two amplifiers okay heavy distortion here yeah we're clipping that's why I got too much signal let me turn the signal down and let me turn up that so we don't have okay balance control oh, that's volume Now my point here is, look at the difference between the channels. Uh, this is what I'm seeing before I do a recap. It seems like they're getting more in line with each other as they go. Okay, let's go down in frequency. Let's go to 90 hertz. 80, 70, 60, 50. Okay not doing too good on 20 hertz but then it's not supposed to be doing good it's 10 hertz you're starting to see the effect of the output capacitor on the uh, circuit okay one thing I want to do is check frequency response so we're gonna do the low end I have this set up for 720 hertz and I have the base control set flat I believe if I turn on the contour makes a difference. Okay, let's turn on the frequency. Seems like it's getting larger. Except... Okay, we're at uh, 110 hertz. Let's go down. Seems to be staying stable. Right about here, it's dropping quite a bit. Go back up in frequency. 40 hertz, it drops off. Let's go down to 20 hertz. Quite a bit down, 10 hertz. 
even more. It's a little weak on the low end. It's to be expected. Okay, one thing I'm gonna check on, um, this is high frequency response and I'm at 1000 Hertz right now. I'm gonna go up in frequency. Let's see how it holds up. It seems like it's getting Okay, what are we at now? 16,000? 17 is starting to drop. I think we got some kind of a modulation on this. And 20 kilohertz. So where are we at here? Let's keep going till it starts to drop. Yeah, we're up from over 60 kilohertz right now. Still holding up. So the top end's really good, I must say. So those tests kind of confirmed what I thought all along. The low end on this is kind of weak and it drops off around 40 hertz, it drops off. And everything below 40 hertz is kind of like a sliding slope where it goes down, down, down. Now you need that spectrum of your music to sound, have a really good sound. And we're just missing that here. It's kind of, it's not there. And the square wave test confirms, I think we have a an issue with some of these caps in this uh, control amplifier. Uh, one thing I forgot to do is I should have fed a signal straight into the power amp and measured that as well. It would have been looked a lot better, but I think for now we get the idea. We can do that later. I'm going to replace these caps. I'm going to replace the caps in the AM tuner, FM, to, uh, IF, and then the multiplex. And then we'll come back and we'll do some uh, more tests. Another thing I'm going to do, I'm going to remove these five switches, clean them. Remove this switch, the function switch, and clean that. It has a has a real issue, and then I'm going to rewire the uh, the speakers and power feeds, and uh, we'll get that cleaned up as well. Yeah, I don't know if you can see that, but it says 24 gauge. That's even worse than 22. So, yeah, it's all coming out. All this wiring. This is stranded though. I'm replacing it with 16. This is power wire. I'm going to replace power wires with 16 gauge. All right, I got six uh, transistors here I need to replace. These are the 2SC458s. Notorious for, for uh, being noisy after time. I'm going to replace them with some 2SC1845s. They don't have the same pinout, but you have to put them in backwards and it works. Pay attention to the pinout. Finish the recap. Uh, this is the multiplex board. And this capacitor on the schematic, it reads 4.7 microfarad. And um, I pulled out a four, 470 nanofarad electrolytic. Now, I don't know if the uh, schematics are wrong or not, because it shows actually two capacitors, one before the transistor and one after. And I don't see that here on the board. Yeah, there's, there's no two capacitors. What I'm going to do is I'm going to run with the 4.7 and see how it runs. And then uh, if it's uh, not going to work, I'll put back the 470 nanofarad. This pin here in this capacitor, this is the input from the uh, IF section. So multiplex, this is the uh, input signal for the multiplex. All right, so here's the wiring I ripped out of the receiver and replaced with heavier gauge. This all reads 24 AWG. Now, I didn't measure any of this, but this is a stranded core. And it's, uh, I don't know, it's inadequate in my opinion. That wasn't the piece. So the rest of this was, yeah, so quite a bit got yanked out. 
these uh, these twisted pairs, these are all in the speaker lines. You can see how much thin copper they had in that, going back and forth to switches and amps and stuff. Okay, let's get rid of this. This little blue cap was in the AM tuner, and it's um, it's actually 100 nanofarad, but it's polarized. So I'm thinking this is kind of like a tantalum. I'm not 100% sure what kind of caps these are. If anybody knows what kind of caps these are, I've seen these before, and I usually ain't come out and replace them because I don't know uh, their history or what is their chemistry. I don't even know what that is. But it's easy just to put a film cap in its place and uh, life goes on. But like I said, if anybody knows what they are, let me know below. And these are the electrolytics. Pretty much all of them are fine. You can still run with them. They are they are out of tolerance, like 100 microfarad would read 125 and uh, so on. But I pull them all out, put brand new caps in, and uh, we're going with that. And I also replaced six transistors, as you can see them there on the bottom. These are the these are the 2SC 5458s, ones with silver legs. And these ones uh, are notorious for going noisy. I checked the gain. Three of them have good gain. Three of them have diminishing gain. So I think that was a good call on that part. So those are all replaced in this, in this uh, receiver so far. And I broke a resistor when I was manipulating. I broke a, a 1K resistor, so I replaced it. Okay, now that I got the speaker's power all rewired, let's do our tests again on uh, our internal resistance Let's see how far it went down I have a feeling it's going to be a little improvement so let's check the right channel on system one okay here is so we're down to 28 milliohms okay let's check system two speaker system two 24 milliohms, 23, seem a little better. A little shorter wire run. It's good. Okay, let's check the other channel. Your system 2, 20 milliohms. It's getting better and better. I think cleaning those switches is a good. Uh, Good move. And then system one again, 24, 23 milliohms. So I'm really happy with that. So far, that's all okay. So the switches are done. Took these five switches out, cleaned them, and uh, rewired. Like I said on the last video, what I did is I rerouted the wires from the power amplifier. They ran down underneath here under around by this power under this channel all the way up to the front and then went to the switch and then it ran back again the same path it came back down to this channel the side channel underneath all this power wiring back to the speaker terminals and I eliminated all that and I went straight across from the switch to the back made the wire shorter and heavier gauge so that's why we see such a huge reduction in uh, in internal resistance and it also isolates this speaker wiring from this AC mains because we're getting crosstalk between the between the two not so much from the speaker to the mains but any noise that comes in on the power cord will be induced into those wires that were hanging in the back here and come up on your speakers as pops and clicks and I got rid of a lot of that and separate the two so that uh, those noises can't get transferred that easily. might still be there, but it might not be noticeable either. So I'm going to clean this up, dress all this wiring up, and uh, snitch it down. And the last thing I need to do is I need to clean this switch. This switch was showing is uh, problems on my test a few days ago I was testing this and the switch is cutting in and out. It's uh, probably just dirty oxidation so I'm gonna have to work on this next. Okay let's attack the switch. 
Now I removed the nut, removed it from the front ch chassis, and I also removed this wire, this black wire. It came from the dial lamps up above, and that just gives me freedom to pull it out because this wire is too short. So now, first thing I did is I took pictures of all these connections, digital pictures, just to make sure if one of these wires gets flexed enough and pops off, then I know where it came from. And uh, I'm just going to try and be careful here with moving this around. I'm going to remove this twist tie because this is impeding me. We need to sho shove wires around. What I'm going to do basically is just disassemble this switch. There's three layers of wafers and I'm going to clean the center disc with uh, contact cleaner. Now I think you guys will be able to see better if I put this under here. It'll probably give you better contrast. Okay. Now, this first wafer here at the front has these four wires coming off of it. These are for the lamps, the function lamps up in front. So I don't think we need to clean that one. That, that one's working. We can, If we can get in there, we'll clean it. But if we don't need to, it's not a big deal. It's not going to affect our sound. These two wafers at the back are for our switching of our audio signals. So let's remove this nut off the back. That's awfully tight. Hang on. I need is there we go. Try and do this without losing everything. And if I lose hardware, I'll just replace it with new, but it's not a big deal for me anyways, but okay. Now I think I can back this screw out. I think this back plate's got it. No, it's not. It's not threaded. So let's uh, move this one back. Okay, that one's loose. Can move this back plate. Now I start to see all the dirt and grime back here. I don't know if you can see that. Let's see how black it is. So I'm just going to take 401B and I'm just going to just going to clean up this. It's actually coming back better already. Oh, we dropped the ball bearing. Look at that. So you gotta be aware of that. I was wondering why I lost the uh, ability. Okay, we'll have to put that back. That, oh, that's, yeah, okay. Is there two ball bearings or one? I think there's two, and I lost the other one too as well. There it is. Okay. Here's some more stuff that went missing. Let's put this aside for now. Got spacers and ball bearings. Okay. Um, yeah, I just want to keep cleaning this. Is having dropouts on uh, one or both channels of the switch. Okay. Now I want to get to the wafer under it, so I'm going to have to figure out a way here. Uh, let's see. 
Uh, now I got this wire here that I'm going to need to snip. So let's snip this wire. We can always recreate it later. And that will allow the two wafers to separate. I think that's the only one. So let me pull this off gently. Oops. It's holding it. Something's holding on this side. Nope. Okay. Got more washers, spacers. I'll pick it up later. Okay. Let's move this carefully out of the way. And then I can treat this wafer. Give it another shot. This one's cleaner. You want to be careful with your cotton swab that you're not snagging and bending these uh, these fingers because if you open it up, then they have they lose their contact and then they don't they don't make as good a contact anymore. So you just got to be careful with them. separate this and I can go in here and give this a little wipe. I think that's going to do it. Now I'm going to treat with some deoxid D100. I'm just going to put a small amount on each track. Okay. Put this one back. spacers back in. Got one spacer here. I'm just going to back the screw out and slip it in. Put the screw back. Let's do the other side. Where is it? Yeah, I think my one spacer fell down below. I have to go dig it out now. Just give me a minute. Okay. Back this screw out. I have this spacer in here. thread is up front here. Otherwise I'd just be able to pull the screw out and uh, go that way, but let me just put these screws back in. 
Actually, what I should do is put the ball bearing back in while I have freedom to do that. Okay. Give ourselves lots of room. Back these out, and then I can lift this spring plate. There, lots of room. Blob of grease. Blob of grease. Okay. Ball bearing. Oh, come on. Another ball bearing. Tighten these two down. That should hold those ball bearings in place. Just want to snug them, you don't want to crank them too hard. Okay, we're still intact, we still have our spacers in, so we need two more spacers. Where is our spacers? These ones are a lot shorter, and they go right on the end here, we got two of them. And then we got our backing plate. And then we need our nuts and washers. You know what? I'm going to see what size are these. I just want to see what size these nuts are. I'll get a nut driver. Okay, so they're five mil. You can find a five mil socket. Okay. Let's put this one on. Wow. testing my patience today. There we go. Another one. Oh, I lost the washer. Didn't notice that. Where is it? Down here? What's this? All right, five millimeter. Snug this down too. 
It'll go crazy on the torque. These are just little tiny threads on these screws. All right. Quite stiff. Okay, I think we're golden. All right, now what I need to do is I need to resolder this connection I cut, and then I can put this back in. Oh dear, look at this. This is a mistake on my part. Look at this one's crooked, but it's not. It's got about a millimeter from touching, but this one here looks pretty pretty close. I'm gonna have to fix that. It's supposed to be an uh, insulator between the two. Let's see what kind of voltage we have between the two. Can you see that? I hope so. Fifty-five volts. Look at that. So you don't want that to short there. I'm going to have to repair that. So the right channel is a little weaker than the left. We're getting. Um, I didn't do the calculation, but it's quite a bit and it's noticeable on the meters. I just want to check and make sure we're getting full power to our amplifiers. So I'm going to turn this on. I got it already set up with a thousand hertz tone into the dummy load and it's running full power. Let's turn it back on. And let's check here for our rail voltages at the amplifiers. So here's the right channel. 14.6465 in the left channel, 46.5. So between the two, this should be equal. Yeah, we're getting 27 millivolts difference between the two. I wonder if it's on here. We're getting 100 and 150 millivolt drop there, and 119 there. That's probably our discrepancy right there. Is we're using different fuses. Uh, I got 119 millivolt drop across that fuse, and 160, 143 on that fuse. Let me see if I can find a couple fuses that are more matched. We're getting quite a bit of drop here because we're probably pushing close to an amp and a quarter amp, over an amp for sure, I think. Our rail voltage is right here, 46.5, 46.4. Yeah, we're losing a tenth of a volt here. So what I did is I just swapped the fuses on the left and right channel just to confirm so I'm going to turn this back on and uh, let's have a look at it. I think as of right now the right channel looks a little better. The right left channel is not clipping. Let's turn it up a little. There we go here. Yeah, we're at 14.9 volts RMS on the output. So what do we got across this? 9, 10, Still getting a drop across these fuses. Not the best fuse holders. Hundred and twenty millivolts there. Hundred and seventy millivolts there. Not good. We're running about a hundred milliohms on each of these fuses. That's just the price you pay for fuse protection. There's nothing you really do about that unless you just eliminate it fully but then you have no protection on your amplifier so I'm just gonna leave it alone I think it's performing better than what it was okay this is future Trevor so uh, looks like the thing is completed and you're right it is so what happened was I filmed the whole segment of doing the power tests and all the other tests and I was back 
editing the video down and looked in that looking at the film clips of the video of the tests and I made a couple of big goof ups I had my left and right probes uh, swapped on the oscilloscope and I didn't realize it so I was measuring wrong channels and I was giving wrong numbers so all that footage of me filming up the power tests and all I just threw it in the garbage and I decided to do it over again so here we are this is long after the fact of the finished receiver so let's do a quick power test I already did the 10 minute endurance test and it passed really did really well on that didn't get hot so all I really need to do is I need to take some maximum power measurements and I need to do some square wave tests and then we'll be done so I'll get this uh, underway now I went back to episode 81 where this receiver premiered and looked at the measurements there um, just want to go over this quickly here now with the original factory 2200 microfarad cap in the power supply I got a maximum output voltage of 13 volts which equates to about 21.125 watts all right now when I replaced the bulk filter capacitor with an 8200 microfarad power output jumped to 13.98 volts which is 24.22 watts so that's quite an increase I think I didn't do the math. I think it was almost like 10% increase in power output. Just from one thing of replacing that filter capacitor with a larger one. So now we've done that and we know that information. So we've gone through and we've done a, a lot of other stuff here. We've done some rewiring and some other things, recapping. So let's go through and do our final power test for this one. So let's turn this on. And we have our signal already set up and ready to go. I haven't... So let's increase this and this time I got my left and right probes on the right channel so your top trace is your left and bottom trace is your right let's go up to clipping there's clipping there let's back it off a little bit until the stop I'm looking for the top to stop fluttering on that left channel Right about here, I can see it right about there, I think. This is a hard measurement to take because it's so... Uh, such a fine adjustment. I'm going to go with that right there. And what we have right now is 13.80. Which is actually a little bit less than our last measurement of 13.92. Let's see here, let's increase it a little. Yeah, now we're into 14 and a half. So it's very touchy. And depending on how this was set on the last measurement, it depends on the result, right? So I would say right there. It's still fluttering a little bit. Just past this point here. Yeah, I got 13.8, zero. So that's that. Okay, let's try the other channel. Let's measure the right channel. It looks like we might have a little bit of a difference in output. We have quite a bit of difference in output. And the right channel is less. So let me swap my voltmeter leads. Let's take the right channel up to clipping. Right there, I can see it fluttering. Take it back and take it back slowly until it stops. Right here. And we have, well, let's see, is that? trying to hunt for that spot I would say right here right there I guess and we're getting 13.44 volts RMS here's our power consumption 100 and 
one watts. So we didn't get any gains from over our last time, which is fine because we're still running with the same filter cap and everything's good that way. So let's uh, turn this down and let's do our square wave tests. I'll set up for that. All right, here we go on our square wave. And our base cut, base boost. Seems like we're getting a little bit funny stuff going on that left, the right channel, the bottom trace. Trouble cut. Treble boost. Now we might have some components in the tone circuit that aren't matched. That's what I'm thinking is going on here. In the treble circuit. If we go, yeah, we can, yeah, they don't quite match. I have a feeling there's like a cap in there or something that's got a, a bad value. So that's the difference there. We might have to go back in and look at that. Okay, balance. Right, left. Okay, and then our power output. Seems like we have something going on in that right channel, bottom trace. Let's go up in frequency. Let's go to two killers, three. You see quite a bit of difference. The left channel is holding up really well, and that right channel doesn't look good at all. Where are we at here? 20 kilohertz. They're both starting to get identical. Let's turn it down. That is 9 kilohertz. And that rate channel looks a lot noisier too. I'm beginning to wonder what that is. We have a problem in the rate channel. I'm going to swap on the amplifier output here. I'm touching the back. I'm going to swap these two and uh, we're going to see if it changes. If this changes, then we know the trouble's in the preamplifier or the power amplifier. So just bear with me. Okay, so I just swapped left and right on the back here with the jumpers. Let's see how this goes. So we still have noise on that right channel. Let's see how our... Let's go back to 1 kilohertz. And let's look at this again. Okay, so things have changed here. The tonal quality has changed on the top trace, which tells me that the preamplifier is having troubles uh, and then the noise is coming from the power amplifier. So that's something we're going to have to look into. Okay, that was a good test. I think we learned a lot from that. Now that square wave test showed us that we have something wrong in one of the channels and it's in the high frequency range which means it's con somehow connected with this treble pot. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to check all of these capacitors, make sure they're all within spec and within tolerance and these resistors as well. Because I have a feeling we got a bump capacitor here somewhere that is out of tolerance, and that's why one channel's off on our square wave test. Now they should be both in balance. If the pot's the same, the parts are the same, and then the resistors are all the same, it should be the same. But for whatever reason, it's not. And it's in the high frequencies, not the lows. So the, I suspect a cap around here. So I'm going to take my time and poke around here and check these. This is the contour switch. And I'm going to check that as well, and then we'll uh, see if we can figure out this mystery. Okay, so I'm yanking caps out and testing them. Um, for the most part, they're pretty good. 
Now this is a 220 nanofarad 50 volt and it's got a K on the back. The K is the tolerance. So K means 10%, J means 5%, right? So I'm measuring these caps. Uh, this one of them is out by about uh, 5 nanofarad, no, it's actually more than that. It's out by about 5%, let's say. So it's still within the tolerance, but it might be enough to make the circuit go wonky and not balance. So I'm going to go through and I'm going to match up some of these caps so that they're, the left and right channel is more balanced and uh, more in line with each other. I'm going to make sure that these two are the same. I'm going to make sure these two are the same, these two are the same. I'm going to go through and do all that for this tone board here, this uh, this um, bass and treble controls. I'm going to make sure all these caps are the same in value for each channel so there's no differences because right now we do have differences. I'm also going to do the same for the resistors. I'm going to go through and make sure they're within a, you know 1% of each other just so it rules out any of the resistors that's causing this problem or any of the capacitors. I'm just going to go through and do that now. I have a feeling it's more to do with the uh, potentiometer itself. I'll, I can actually measure these two and see how far out they are from each other. They're easy to measure. You got one channel here, one channel here. You just measure and make sure they track together. Um, yeah, so let me finish this and we'll, I'll go through and I'll let you know what I found. All right, so I went through and overhauled this little board here. Now, I made a few changes. I, I didn't make any changes to the values. I made changes to the parts. Put a few new parts in. Uh, replaced a bunch of parts that were, they weren't too bad, but I wanted to match these the channels, the resistors and the channels. I wanted to match the capacitors. So what I did is I pulled out parts that were paid maybe 5% out and replaced them with parts that were within 1% of each other. Not with necessarily within the value, but with each other so that they match. And uh, now to be perfectly honest, I think it's the, uh, the, the tone control that's out of whack. I measure about a 2K difference between the two sides when I go through the range and that's enough to set the, um, the tone difference. So I cleaned it, gonna put it all back together. Uh, I don't know if it's gonna make a hell of, hell of a lot of difference, but like I said, I matched parts, I replaced some resistors, replaced some caps, and uh, should be a little better, I guess. All right, so I got the tone board back in uh, for the tone controls. Let's do a quick test here, square wave, and see if I just wasted my time or if actually it's helped. So turning it on. And I'm feeding it a square wave already. Should be there on the screen. Okay, let's bring this up. Now we got base cut, base boost. And we can see it's it's actually a little better. Is our treble? Right about there. So yeah, they were at probably 1130 on the potentiometer but we still have a little bit of difference trouble cut trouble boost I think it's improved a bit not much like I said I think the major major uh, differences in the uh, between the two potentiometers I don't think they're balanced very good now there's one thing I could have done I guess is swapped the bass and treble controls the potentiometer and the bass and treble because the bass doesn't seem to be so like if I if I manipulate the bass control it doesn't seem to be as, as sensitive as the treble is the treble has a lot more sensitivity when I move it but you know what I'm not going to worry about it because I don't think anybody will be able to hear that much difference between the channels yeah Yes, I think it is the potentiometer, to tell you the truth. And you can null that out by just hitting the right position. Maybe I should do this. Oh, uh, let's see. You see the potentiometer is not quite at the top position. It's off to the left a little. Okay. All right. Now that we're finished up, let's have a little scan through the band and see how it sounds. Let's plug it in first. It helps.
One thing I noticed about this receiver is it's got a great little tuner in it and it's working really well. I didn't touch the, the alignment or adjustment or anything. Just let it be as it is and it works. So let's try this. Yeah, it's, it's picking up the weak ones really well. It gets pretty good separation. You can hear the separation come in when that stereo light comes on. by Nancy Snatra back. To uh, my uh, take with home, Dallas, from five years ago, <laughs> yeah. six years ago. and Safeway liquor buy more sleep more that's only don't the junk one did the monk kitty they say sensitive locations what are you up to this morning I'm just taking it easy bit of snow shoveling tidy up it'd be a perfect day to win fifteen thousand five hundred dollars wouldn't it sure would yeah what would you spend that on probably some property taxes and Wow, I'm spend it. It's a true Canadian gonna spend all their money on taxes. That's it. Yeah, it sounds good. I can't wait to get this on the bench, listening bench, and try it out on uh, some some music. I want to try out the, the phono stage. I did try out the phono stage before, and it was working pretty good. Um, I'm gonna try it out again. The FM is working great. Uh, Amplifier is working great. It seems like everything is doing good on this one. So that's all I'm going to do in this one, and like I said, I think it's uh, nicely sorted now. I think there's a lot of improvements we made, and a lot of fixes we did. Uh, and this is going to be a good performer, uh, as opposed to a stock version of this. We made some good improvements. Now, I was looking at the changes that Harman Kardon made to this model over the previous model, and they, what they did is they upped some uh, heat sinking. I notice this this amplifier gets a little warmer when it's running. I don't know. I didn't really look too carefully at the differences between the two, but I think they're pretty much identical. I think they just uh, you know they split the board in half and uh, did it with two boards instead of one. Other improvements they made: multiplex section is much better. Yeah, the FM IF is much better. Um, AM I think they left untouched because it was working fine. And uh, I think the phono stage is also uh, the same without any changes. But that wraps it up for this one. So next we're going to look at a 330C. We're going to go to the next model um, that superseded this one. Um, came out, I don't know the, the years, but I'll look it up. So next on the bench, 330C, and uh, we're going to put this one to rest. And I'm thinking I'll probably end up selling this one because I really don't have, uh, I do have two of these 
in my stock right now and I don't need to so I'm thinking of selling one of these so uh, I'll think about that but until next time thanks for watching and we'll see you on the next one take care